You know, you try to raise your kids and do right by them and so on, and we did really well. We had four children. Three of them turned out great. Good morning to you and welcome to Northeast to this service and I know you members are here but we also have the online crowd and we want to say to them we're glad you're joining us too. I probably have some loved ones in North Carolina that might be watching on right now too. And anyway, I hope that uh, we can have a, a good uh, worship service here in, in studying God's Word. Uh, one of the things I want you to know that about uh, my love for this church has increased manifold. I've loved it for years because this is one of God's great churches. I mean, you don't understand. If you live here and you don't understand the, what, what this church's influence is, it's na nationally known. And you have influenced so many people, and the ministry of this church is one that I admire greatly because Jesus Christ is alive and well, and was that not cool uh, what we saw just down in the morning? That's why, that's why we're in business right there. But I also want you to you know, I, I love this church because, because my, our son Tyler, you know, he, well, you guys took custody of him a few years ago. I mean, <laughs> uh, you gained a teaching pastor, but Marcy and me, when he finished two years of daycare, three years of preschool, two years of kindergarten, flunked one time, 12 years of public school, 12 years of public school, four years of college, three years of seminary, he finally went out and got a real job at a real church with a real paycheck, and we got him off our payroll, and that was a praise the Lord day, I can tell you. <laughs> yeah, he's your problem now. You know, some, some, some parents worry about the empty nest syndrome. We kept worrying about the empty bank account syndrome, but I mean, anyway. I also love this church because you really are ministering not only to churches, but to our church. My church in North Carolina does a love the Ville thing. We call it Leave It Better. And we've been doing it for several, doing it for several years, but, but we, we started following your model. And we came up back in May, and your staff took a day off from work. And literally, they were working whenever they were not working because what they did was they sat down with us and they shared with us their organizational skills and promotional tricks and creative ideas for Love the Ville and how they engaged the members in it and so on and other things that were behind the scenes. And it was an all-day event. All I can tell you is we walked away blown away, not only by the attention we got and also the class way they did it and so on, but also by the detail, the attention to detail that they gave us that we are using right now in North Carolina. This Love the Bill thing, it's big. Whether you realize or not how unique is happening at this church, this is something other churches are not doing. You are admired, and there will be a lot of people like us who are using you in some sense as the word as a role model to encourage us. And by the way, I especially admire, I tried to hire some of your staff members, I, you know, Rhonda, your, exec, your executive pastor, she is a, she's a rock star, okay? And I said to Rhonda, I said, well, come on down with us, she said, well, I don't know, I said, we'll double your pay. <laughs> and she said no. And I'm thinking, they're either paying her too much, or, I mean, or a lot, I should say, or it could be the fact that she just loves Jesus that much, and I guess that must be what it is. But also, Randy, love the Ville pastor. Uh, these, these are resource people that we admire and appreciate. Thank you, Northeast, for blessing our congregation. My message this morning fits right into the current season's focus on why Jesus. Jesus is, is, is in some senses the word, the most misunderstood person in history. Not maybe by you and me, but a lot of people have false perceptions. And that's the reason why it's important for us to understand one of these attributes that is one of the greatest blessings for you and me this day, and I hope that you'll walk out of here this morning with it firmly in your hand. You see, during Jesus' days here on this earth, he did three things pretty much in his ministry. Number one is he loved like nobody ever loved. Number two, he taught in a way that nobody else taught. Never a man spoke like Jesus, right? But number three, he affirmed his love and affirmed his teachings by doing signs and wonders the bible calls it which is another word for miracles in other two, in other words he was getting authenticated his ministry and so on and his identity as god in the flesh was authenticated by the power of miracles he had in inside of himself and what i want to say to you this morning and this is kind of like the theme for the entire service is this do you believe in miracles somebody cue up al, al michaels you know do you believe in miracles and i hope the answer is yes to guide our conversation this morning and kind of engage you what i want to do first of all is to show you a visual portrayal a dramatic portrayal of acts the third chapter which is sort of the central theme passage i'm going to be using it's the story of jesus healing a lame man now after you watch this there's two things you may come out of it saying okay bill what is this it's, it's this amazing miracle and it's jesus working this miracle you said well 
what's so amazing about this miracle? I mean, yeah, it's a miracle. That's all, they're all amazing. But this is not an amazing miracle among miracles because it, it's not the raising of the dead or feeding of the 5,000 for a little lunch and so on. And that's true, except this miracle becomes amazing because a lot of the things that have to do with the setting of it. Well, Bill, there's also this thing. You said that Jesus worked this miracle. I know Acts, the third chapter. This is after Jesus has ascended into heaven. Peter and John are the ones in the drama who worked the miracle, right? And the answer is yes, no. You see, Jesus is not there in the flesh, in the physical sense, but he's there in the power. Let's watch the video and see if you can see that. Roll the video, please. Anything to give? Alms? Look on us. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up. Isn't that awesome? I mean, that's awesome. <laughs> Show of hands. How many of you believe that story really happened? Raise your hand. All right, if your hand's not up right now, I would understand if you're somebody that's not a believer in miracles. But I want you to know this one's true, and here's why. Because it's written in the Bible, and God's Word is the book of truth. But I believe this story because I believe in miracles. I believe that Jesus Christ is a God of miracles. I believe that the foundation of our faith is the fact that our God is powerful. How powerful? He is all-powerful. Whenever, whatever, wherever, however, he wants to do anything, he can do it. He doesn't even have to think about it. Impossible things are a snap. He doesn't break out of sweat. He just speaks the word, boom, and it comes into being. That's the way he created the world. It's the way he still works miracles to this day. And so how about it? My question to you is, do you believe in miracles? And not just in Miracles that happened in Bible days. Do you believe that miracles still happen today? Boy, I do. Back in 1993, we have four children, and Tyler has three sisters. Two of the oldest, uh, the oldest two are, are twins. And these twin girls, Ashley and Jennifer, when they turned 16, we, we needed a new set of wheels because they both got their driver's licenses. And so we entered into that exciting time in which our daughters are driving for the first time. And, and we gave them what we thought was the, the best possible chance to survive in case of an accident. We gave them a 1981 Cadillac Seville. Now this is like 
12 years old, had a million miles on it. It was a family heirloom that had been handed down that was old and dinged up and you know the fabric inside was kind of not right and so on it was it was one of those disposable cars but it was also as big as a tank on wheels okay and so we gave it to them and hoped that that would work and at the same time i went out and purchased for the first time in my life a brand new car 1994 honda accord oh i love that car i'm so proud of that car i'm a brand new car well about two weeks after ashley and jennifer get their license and two weeks after i bought this car Ashley was gone in the tank, and Jennifer, the other twin, needed to run an errand. She came to me and said, Dad, could you just let, could, could I borrow your car? I, I won't be long, but, but i, I got to go run an errand. It's something for school tomorrow and so on. Could I just use your car for a minute? And I said to myself, oh, my gosh, this is my car. It's still got the new smell car. I didn't even tear off the sticker off the window. I want everybody to know I have a new car. <laughs> and I took the keys and looked at her as a generous dad, and I said, Sure, 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 here, Jennifer, you take the car. Just be careful. Oh, I will, Dad. I, I promise I will. And out the door she went. Ten minutes later, we got a phone call. And it's the phone call that you parents all dread, trust me. It was a police officer that said, Mr. McKenzie, your daughter has been in an accident down here on Peters Creek Parkway. And it's a bad one, real bad. The paramedics right now are still checking her out. And I, I want you to know we think she's okay. But she's pretty shook up, and, and you need to get here as fast as you can get there. I didn't have to listen to that last phrase. The phone was already dropped. We were out the door in Marcy's car, zooming three miles down the road to where this accident was. And when we arrived, we saw police cars and fire trucks and an ambulance or two over on the side. And, and we also saw Jennifer that was standing on one side of the road. Everybody else was kind of on the other side. But she's over here near, next to the ambulances, and she's standing up, and they're talking to her so we can see that she was sort of okay. So as soon as we stopped, Marcy, psh, Lickety split. She ran to Jennifer. Me, the dad, I went to see the car. <laughs> and the situation of the car is one that you have to understand the situation. It, it, Peters Creek Parkway at this point has about a 20, 25 foot drop off down a bank. And there's a golf course over here. In fact, the course floods a lot of times because it's kind of a flood plain, but 25 foot drop. And Jennifer, as she was driving towards town, the officer went, went on to explain to me, we think she was driving the speed limit. And as she was going along 55 miles an hour, a possum ran out on the road and crossed the road in front of her. And she jerked the wheel to the side. I cornered her later on. I said, Jennifer, when a possum goes out on the road, do you understand? What that possum is trying to say is, I'm ready to go. <laughs> you know, I'm ready to go. Send me the possum of heaven. Just, just give him what he wants. <laughs> she didn't give him what she wanted. She missed the possum. She jerked it to the right, her tires went off the edge of the pavement, suddenly she had no control, and she did the Dukes of Hazard thing. She zoomed off the bank. She hit one tree, knocked it down. Hit a second tree, knocked out branches. Finally landed on the side of the bank, rolled over once and twice, and she wound up next to the first green at the Wilshire Golf Course, sitting upright. Except for the fact the engine then caught on fire. And she had to crawl out of a window that had been busted out during the, the wreck and so on, and and to escape the, and, and climb up the bank and to, to, to safety and so on. I saw this, this mess when I looked down there and so on. I turned around and there was Jennifer over there on the other side. And she's sobbing out loud, Dad, I'm sorry I wrecked your car. Dad, I'm sorry I wrecked your car. So I walked over to her and I gave her the bear hug she needed. And then I took her by the hand and I walked her back over to the bank. And we both looked down where we could see the car and the people that were dealing with it at that time. And I said, Jennifer, do you see that car? I want to see you know I love you. I'm so thankful that you're okay. I mean, that's really the only thing that matters. That car, that car's a thing. It can be replaced, but you can't. You're precious to me. I love you. But then I added, but Jennifer, you know, in the trunk of that car are my golf clubs. <laughs> and if one of them is scratched or bent, you haven't survived this wreck yet. I actually didn't say those words to her. She didn't laugh. <laughs> anyway, I went... I walked away from that, and a couple of the emergency workers that I knew kind of cornered me off to the side. They said, Pastor McKenzie, I've got to tell you what. We work a lot of accidents, and I want you to know that this is a bad one. I mean, this car is destroyed. The fact is, we're all amazed the fact that your daughter's only injuries is that when she was climbing up the bank, she went through briars and got scratched. But otherwise, she's fine. And all we can say is, it is a miracle of God that girl, girl is alive and well. Do you believe in miracles? I'm going to tell you what. I sure do. And Marcy does. And Jennifer believes in miracles too. 
You see, this is what the truth is. Anytime supernatural God directly intervenes in the natural lives of women and men on this earth in a physical way, when the supernatural comes into the natural and acts, that's a miracle. You say, well, there's miracles all the time. When the sun comes up, it's a miracle. Okay, that's what I would call part of the natural order that God created as far as the universe is concerned. And it's a miracle, no doubt about it, that God holds things together. And if you've ever been in the, in, in the delivery room when a baby is born, it's, oh, wow, what a miracle that is, the miracle of life. And yet in some senses of the word, that's part of the natural routine. But the fact of the matter is, Sometimes God interrupts life on this earth. The natural order of life is interrupted by the supernatural, and he does things that are not natural, and we call that a miracle. And it happened in Bible days. Jesus did it all the time. And whether you recognize it or not, it still happens today. And so I believe in miracles. I hope you do too. But it's not just what you believe that miracles are true or not. It's also what do you believe about miracles. What do you believe about miracles? Editorial comment. I confess this is a tough comment, a t- tough topic, and I-, I wish I had an hour to, to, or more to, to share in this because there's so many side roads that we would get into. But I just want you to hear this, and I- I'm speaking from my heart now, personal opinion. There's a lot of misinformation and contaminated truth out there about miracles, particularly many teachers and preachers on TV, it seems like, claim to have divine power to work miracles and they can guarantee things to you and so on and naive people sometimes get sucked into that i've had some friends who did that and then they came up disappointed because when you listen to these guys talk you learn what they're doing what they're trying to say is look support our ministry but in the backside, what they're doing is saying that all you got to do you want a miracle just follow the easy plan just tell god your problem write it on the card and send it to us we'll pray for it and believe that he will do what you want him to do and so on. Write on a card. We'll pray for it. And then let us touch you somehow and so on and, and send you $20 in order to support the ministry and so on. And, and, and what will happen is boom, boom, God will work a miracle for you. Now, I do believe in miracles and I do believe in prayer and I do believe God does supernatural things and so on. So some of the elements of that is truth. But the motive behind this is manipulative and I want to say something to you. If you don't know this already, listen to me. The Bible says in the last days, false teachers and prophets will come. And they'll come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. But as a shepherd of sheep, I want you to know, just because someone quotes the Bible does not mean they are speaking the truth. Just because they quote the book of truth doesn't mean that they are speaking the truth. You follow me? Because the manipulation and the way they string with care of the verses and the things they lead you thinking sometimes are not true. My grandma, my mamma, Thelma, was constantly battling with high blood pressure when she was still a young woman, all things considered. Her hypertension, hypertension was so off the charts and so on that she had to take many medications and so on and, and had to be very careful about what she did and didn't do. One night she attended a revival at her church. And a healer prayed over her, told her with anointing of oil, you are healed. Throw away your blood pressure medicine. You are healed. You'll never struggle with blood pressure again. And she was a woman of faith, and she believed in this man's authority. She threw away her medicine. Mamaw had the best intentions. She was trusting God. She wanted to do the right thing. Three days later, blood pressure shot up. She had a major stroke paralyzed the left side of her and eventually it took her life after a few more years listen to me just because somebody quotes the bible does not mean they are speaking truth you see it's not god that failed her it's false teaching or misinformation and it was not god's will for her to throw away her medicines because sometimes god works through medicine and doctors and so on i'll get back to that in a second but what i want you to appreciate is the fact is while we have to be cautious of what people say, this is one thing that's true. God's Word teaches us miracles still happen. Here's the proof, Acts, the third chapter. You just watched a video of what we're going to study right now. And let me take you through this story verse by verse and show a few things to you that maybe you haven't read before if you've ever read this scripture. Start with me in Acts 3, verse 1. One day, Peter and John, those are the two guys that were the principals as far as this video is concerned. Peter and John are best friends. They grew up in Capernaum. They both were fishermen. They both had been recruited by Jesus Christ to become not only part of his 12 disciples, but along with John's brother James, those three were the innermost circle of Jesus. They got to hear and see things the rest of the disciples did not experience. 
So they're almost inseparable. And here they are now, after the church has started, Jesus has ascended into heaven, and in Acts chapter 3, they are at the temple, it says. Three o'clock in the afternoon, the time of prayer, verse 2. And a crippled man from birth was being carried to the temple. The gate called Beautiful was where they were placed him. Where he, every day, all of his life, from birth, he's been crippled. Every day, he begs, he pleads, alms for the poor, alms for the poor. When he saw Peter and John about the end of the temple, he asks them like he had other people. Now, I want you to know, Peter and John had entered the temple this day for a reason. They had learned from Jesus Christ that the temple was a place at 3 o'clock in the afternoon where there was special meaning for those of us of people of faith as Christians. They are already now on the saved part. They already know Christ as a Savior, but they had been Jews. And at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the priest would offer what is known as the evening sacrifice. Every day... An animal would be taken at 3 o'clock. They'd be laid on the altar, and he would be slain ritually. And the sacrifice was such that the blood would flow, and they'd collect the blood, and they would sprinkle it ritually around the courtyard. And what I want you to appreciate is the fact, the reason they did this was, they were following Old Testament law, a law which God had given them for a reason. He was teaching Jewish people throughout the pages of the Old Testament a principle that's important. It's not that God does not love animals. He was saying, without the shedding of innocent blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. This is a ritual of forgiveness. Without the shedding of innocent blood, the animal didn't sin, you did. There can be no forgiveness of sins. There has to be a substitution of innocence for forgiveness of sins. Well, when Peter and John went to the temple that day, they were probably the only two people that were watching this that saw the blood flow and knew this was Jesus Christ on the cross, the one that died for their sins. Well, this crippled man was at the gate beautiful, and he's begging for food. He's begging for money, whatever they would give him. And Peter and John says, I got something better than that to give to you. Listen to me. Here's a nugget that I want you to listen. This man had been lame since birth. Jesus Christ was a Jew. Jesus, many times during his lifetime, probably during the days of his ministry, 20, maybe 30 times, he had gone to the temple. And he'd walked through that gate beautiful. And this man, every day, was sitting on the steps of the temple. When Jesus walked by him, this man was lame. When Jesus left, he was still lame. During the days of his ministry, not one time did Jesus ever heal him. Why? I mean, Jesus has the power, right? Well, here's the answer. When Jesus was on earth, he did not heal everybody. He could have, but he didn't. When he worked miracles, there was always purpose. You see, not everybody got a miracle, and nor did he get miracles today necessarily. Instead, miracles would happen when God would choose to make them happen, or in this case, when Jesus chose to make them happen. And whenever he made them happen, it was always done with, here's the word, the key word is purpose. There was always purpose behind it. God never acts arbitrary. And the sub-motive behind God was always to do something, not just for the person being healed, but something through the person that's being healed in order to accomplish his ultimate will. And that's what happens here, verse 4. Next slide. Peter looked straight at this lame man, as did John. And Peter said to him, look at us. This man, alms for the poor. He has his head down in humility. And he gave them his attention. He looked up. And he's expected to get something from them, money. And Peter said to them, hey, silver and gold we don't have. But what I have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. By the way, Jesus just showed up. You see, it was Peter and John that worked the miracle, but Jesus just showed up in this miracle. Because he is the one, Peter says, he's the one that gets the glory and gets the credit for what's just happened. And I think that's a a point that's lost on a lot of people. Even though Jesus was already in heaven, the church, the early church, had the power to do signs and wonders to authenticate their message. And many people were healed. And Peter did it in Jesus' name. Next slide, verse 7. So taking him by the right hand, Peter said, you know, get up and walk. He helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. How strong? Just like they'd never been in any way, shape, or form. Anything other than normal. In fact, he immediately jumped to his feet. He began to walk. And then what did he do? He went up with them into the temple courts. Now, wait a minute. He went into the temple courts. Why? This probably was the first time in his entire life he ever climbed those steps to the gate beautiful 
inside the temple court. You know why? Because inside the temple court, he was not permitted to go. He was labeled as imperfect, unworthy to be in the presence of the perfect sacrifice that was being made. It was part of the Jewish customary law, not God's law, but man's law. And he had never been inside, and suddenly now, although he, he, he's healed, he's not only healed this way, but he's healed spiritually in a sense, and he walks up these steps for the first time into the courts. And that's why it was such an awesome thing. When he heard the shofar blow, he walked up with his face for the first time to glow, to be able to experience this. And he walked up with Peter and John into the temple courts, and he's walking, and he's jumping, and he's praising God. He's celebrating the power of a miracle, verse 9. Well, all the people took notice of this. They saw him walking and praising God. They recognized him as the same man who for, what, 30, 40 years has been begging at the temple called at the Gate Beautiful, and and they're filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And while the beggar is holding on to Peter and John, they're the ones that worked the miracle. All the people were astonished. And they came running to Peter and John in this place called Solomon's Colonnade. They want to know what has happened, verse 12. When Peter saw this, he said to them, men of Israel, why does this surprise you? For the last three and a half years, this kind of stuff has been happening in this land. Jesus Christ worked many miracles, right? Why do you stare at us as though it's by our own power or godliness that we made this man walk? It's the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of the fathers. He has glorified his servant Jesus this day, in this moment, in this man. This is the Jesus that you disowned, verse 14, the holy and righteous one. But you killed the author of life, and God raised him from the dead. We're witnesses of this, and so are you, verse 16. So by faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It's in Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that we were able to do this thing and this complete healing. We were the agents, but Christ has worked a miracle, as you all can plainly see. Now, brothers, get the message. Why did this happen? I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, when you said, crucify him, crucify him. You need to fix this. Verse 19 says, repent. In your hearts, turn, change, become regenerated. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. And I love this next phrase, that times of refreshing may come to you from the Lord. Isn't that awesome? These people just experience that. Many of you have too. The times of refreshing that come in your heart when you surrender to Jesus Christ. Why was this man healed? This man was not healed because he needed to be healed. Although he needed it. He wanted it from the day he was born. And it was not his fault that he was lame. It's not some accident he did and so on. He was born this way. It's congenital. It's not because God loved him. Hey, you know what? God loves everybody. We're all tied in first place for love from God. It's not because he had great faith. This man did not have great faith in Jesus when the miracle was worked. He gained great faith from it. But it was the faith of Peter and John at this moment who spoke to him in these authoritative ways and said, get up and walk in the name of Jesus. Why does he heal? It's because God had a purpose that he accomplished through this miracle. And it's pretty obvious in this case what the miracle was, purpose was. You see, this is the first miracle that was worked in the church, the early church, first one. Day of Pentecost, the gospel is preached, people heard in different tongues, The languages that were preached, they heard the gospel message. 3,000 people on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, were baptized that day. And the church was off and running. And then Acts 3 comes. And the first thing that happens is Peter and John go to the temple and they work a miracle. And because the miracle is so impressive and also points towards God, they were able to preach the message of Christ. Again, Peter preaches the message he preached in Acts 2 one more time in Acts 3 and 4. And God uses this. Great things are accomplished. In fact, when you get to the end of this, you find out 3,000 in Acts 2, it's 5,000 now who surrendered to Christ. Why? Because this man who was lame at birth, who had suffered many years, and it was an authenticated thing, the supernatural intervened in the natural. His life circumstances was changed. God used the miracle for his glory. There's a message in that. You see, this is the way God works. 
The fact is God loves you. You got problems happening in your life? I think many of us do. You have a loved one perhaps that has financial problems or there's an addiction going on or maybe there's something physical in your life that's, that you're struggling with that is a, a health concern. Maybe you're in a life and death struggle. And you're lifting your eyes to heaven and saying, God, I need help. I need you to intervene. Come into my life and work because you believe God can. Keep praying. You believe in miracles. Don't you stop. Because God is that God of miracles. He can say yes. And when he chooses to, he will. And when he chooses to and says yes, there's a reason why he does it. There's always a blessing that comes. But you should walk away knowing in your heart, the Lord God is on your side. Hey, listen. Over in 1 John, the fifth chapter, there's a verse of scripture that's so cool. It says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we know that if he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that he will answer. We will get it. But you have to ask in his will. And sometimes God's will is not what our will is. My mom had surgery here just a couple of weeks ago. 86 years old. She is a trick. Man, I love my mom. You would love her too if you knew her because she's a special lady and everybody's mom is special. My mom's just, she, this, this, mom, this mom has been a mom of faith for years. She raised five kids and all of them are Christians and she put three of them into, into leadership as far as churches go and so on. And I'm a minister and now I got my son Tyler and it's kind of an extension of the family tree that my dad and my mom brought into reality as far as our home is concerned. Well, about two months ago or three months ago, I should say, she had a pain in her side right, right about in this area and, and they could not figure out what it was. I mean, the doctors ran tests and MRIs and all this kind of thing. There's no tumors. There's no imperfections. They can't see any reason why this is happening. They kept thinking maybe it was a phantom thing or maybe it was a pulled muscle or could it be a kidney stuff. They tried everything they could think of and there was no way they could find the solution to this problem. They kept delaying doing something more invasive like surgery because 86, she's had a couple of other surgeries in the same area and they were fearful that this would take her. In fact, Dr. Jones told her, he said, look, if I do this surgery, you probably will not survive. Mom says, I hurt so bad, I'd rather be in heaven. They said, okay, and they scheduled the surgery. We prayed in August, September, and October for mom to be healed. We prayed, prayed of faith. God, please take the pain away. God didn't take it away. We got up to the surgery time. I told mom, I said, you know, I'm still praying, but God do a miracle. And, and, and you know that I know the surgery is scheduled, but, but God can, he can change the surgery schedule in a quick hurry. All he's got to do is snap his fingers. And Lord, please heal my mom. God didn't heal her. On the day we took her to the hospital, you know, as we went, got over to the hospital and we're praying for the he for healing, nothing happened. We got it. She's laying on the cot. It's about time to be wheeling her into the, into the operating room. And, and I, I told my mom, I said, Mom, I said, if, during the surgery, if you see a light, a shining light, walk into the light. Just go ahead and just walk into the light. Just make sure you put the wheel on the, on the kitchen table before you left. And so and she said to me, she said, don't worry, your name is not in the wheel. I said, Mom, don't walk into the light. Do not walk into the light. <laughs> Whatever you do, <laughs> that actually happened. <laughs> they did the surgery. Dr. Jones came into the room and he said, hey, we think it went great. We're not sure, you know, that we got the problem. We think we did. We got some adhesions here and this and that and so on. And two hours of surgery and your mom tolerated it well. And, and we're just really surprised at how well it went. It was just, it's almost a miracle of God how it happened. I walked over to him. I put my hand out and I shook his hand and said, Dr. Jones, thank you for being the agent of God. And working a miracle for us today. He goes, here's how the way I look at it. We prayed and God answered. He didn't answer the way we wanted it to. We didn't get something that was an instantaneous thing. There wasn't something we could glorify God by, by spreading it to other people. It was something simple and routine that happens all the time in people's lives. And yet, it was the supernatural intervening in the natural as far as I'm concerned. But my mom could easily not be here today except for the fact God intervened. And it was a blessing. In other words, you should trust God. There's so many ways he's operating in your life. Pray your prayers. Offer your needs. And God will answer. I believe in miracles. Let's pray. Father, I know that what we're talking about today is sort of a, it's one of those invisible things. It, it's not tangible. We can't hold it in our hands, this aspect of our faith. And yet we know by faith in you, we know that you care for us. And you're involved in our lives personally in so many ways. Your spirit's in our heart and we have powers we wouldn't have otherwise. And all these things that are true. But one thing, Lord, we have to have from you is, is for you to sometimes just make things right. Marriages that are broken and 
addictions that people can't kick and other mountains they're trying to climb, especially many times health concerns for themselves or a loved one. Lord, whatever it is right now in this room, a lot of people I'm sure are praying prayers saying, Lord, I need you. I know you hear their prayers. We pray by God's will, by your will be done. And Lord, if you snap your fingers and do it, you'll get the praise. We'll make sure everybody knows that you've worked. On the other hand, Lord, we know that you're going to move somehow, in some way. Your answer will come. So we trust in you and your marvelous, marvelous power and wisdom, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Amen.